Hello, I'm Nusali Ganosha, and I'm an Applied Research Scientist at Facebook, and I work on PyTorch performance. Today, I will talk about low precision support, new obstructions for performance that we've implemented in PyTorch, and operator benchmarking. So, low precision support. On modern hardware, you can sacrifice a little bit of precision to achieve a substantially better performance. PyTorch makes working with low precision data types easy and convenient. We support quantization, but uh, that's covered elsewhere. I will mostly be talking about TF32 and FP16 data types. And Bifold 16 is under active development for CPU and GPU, and it is already supported on PyTorch XLA. The diagrams on the right show the memory representation of the corresponding data types. Green boxes are uh, exponent bits, red boxes are mantissa bits. You can see that uh, Bifold 16 can represent a wide dynamic range uh, with eight exponent bits. It's the same dynamic range as uh, for standard FP32 data type. However, uh, it only has a limited precision with uh, seven mantissa bits. FP16 is making an opposite trade-off, and it has a limited dynamic range with a better precision. TF32 is the best of both worlds. Its dynamic range is the same as the standard FP32 data type, but it has as many mantissa bits as FP16 does. TF32 is enabled in PyTorch on new Ampere GPUs. It is backed by 32-bit storage, so standard networks can transparently benefit from it. When computationally intensive operations read input data, they read only 10 bits of Mantissa, so there is some accuracy loss. However, internal accumulation happens in FP32, so we don't expect any effect on conversions. You can turn TF32 on and off to see its effects on performance and conversions using the commands below. We've benchmarked an approximately 3x uh, speed up on Hagen Face uh, Roberta model and approximately 2x speed up on standard convenets such as ResNext. That's compared to uh, FP32 performance on the same hardware. TF32 works out of the box and doesn't require changes to existing scripts, and that's great. However, if you are willing to change your existing script a little bit to achieve an even better performance, FP16 uh, can be useful. Automatic mixed precision is now supported in PyTorch, and this feature has evolved from popular Apex package maintained by NVIDIA. Uh, it automates training of networks in FP16 and takes care of numerical issues that arrive, uh, arise in FP16 training due to its limited dynamic range. AMP in PyTorch was designed to cover a wide range of use cases. It supports operations on unskilled gradients. It supports operations on sparse gradients. Higher order gradients can be computed via Torch Autograd. Uh, custom Autograd functions, both Python and C++, are supported. If you have complicated scripts involving multiple models and multiple losses, that is supported too. End-to-end -end example and documentation are available on PyTorch website. This is a simple example of using AMP. There are two important parts. The first one is scalar object that controls loss scaling, and the second one is AMP Autocast Context Manager. Loss scaling is required to ensure convergence and numerical stability, and Autocast Context Manager makes sure that uh, much models and convolutions are run in FP16, thus achieving the best performance, while operations that require full precision are run in FP32. Finally, there is a slightly different uh, syntax for calling an optimizer step, and you also have to update a loss scale for the next iteration, as shown in this snippet. But overall, the code changes required are pretty minimal, and you should be able to achieve an even better performance than you can with TF32. Also, FP16 is supported on all regenerations of GPUs, such as Volta and Turing. Now let's move on to the next topic, and uh, that's channels lost. In many backends uh, and uh, for many data types, such as, for example, TS32 and FP16 that we've just discussed, convolutions perform best when data is in channels lost format. PyTorch supports channels lost physical memory format while preserving traditional semantic meaning of the dimensions. So, for example, for a 4D tensor, first dimension is still number of batch elements, uh, second dimension is channels, and the rest are spatial dimensions. To fully take advantage of uh, channels lost support, all or most operations in the model have to support channels lost, and most operations in PyTorch do. For example, a popular model in Torch Vision are covered. 
Here uh, we have a small example that shows how to uh, convert model to uh, channels last format by calling a helper function. The input uh, has to be in channels last format also. So you have to either modify your data loader to directly provide input in channels last or call a conversion function on input manually somewhere in the script. Input layout is propagated across most operations, so intermediate variables in the network will remain channels last. Copy and tensor factory operations also preserve layout as shown here uh, on the example ones like operation similar like tensor factories will also preserve the layout of their inputs. Pointwise operations always preserve the layout of their inputs and uh, copy operations also produce uh, the outputs in the same format as the input was. For convnets, you can expect about 20% gain from switching to channels last. Another interesting feature that we implemented in PyTorch are 4H APIs that provide efficient pointwise operations on batches of tensors. Instead of launching a small kernel for each tensor in the batch, 4H launches a few larger kernels, each processing many tensors. This pattern is especially common and uh, useful for optimizers. Even now, you can avoid uh, launching multiple kernels if you copy the tensors to a contiguous memory region and then operate directly on this contiguous memory region. But this requires extra memory and can be brittle if different subsets of tensors uh, participate in operations. For each operates on tensors in disjoint memory regions directly, and lists can be cheaply assembled before each application. Here are the timelines that compare operating on batches of tensors in a loop and for each. The GPU timeline for a loop is shown in the bottom row. The, you can see that GPU here is idle most of the time. There are very short kernel, but mostly it's space between kernels. CPU is busy constantly launching those small kernels. In contrast, when we are doing the same operation using for each APIs, GPU is always busy and it's running a relatively larger kernels. CPU is busy in the beginning submitting those kernels, but then it's idle for the rest of the time. While the upper timeline shows just a handful of tensors processed, in the lower timeline a few hundred tensors were processed in the same amount of time. PyRoach 1.7 has common optimizers implemented using for each APIs. For each, uh, and they achieve approximately uh, from 3 to 6x or even larger speed up, depending on the number of parameters in your network. For each is also easy to use to implement your own optimizers or if you have the patterns in your network that uh, require operating on the irregular batches of tensors. So uh, give it a try, uh, replace your optimizer with uh, for each based one and uh, see if it improves your performance. Finally, uh, let's talk about benchmarking utilities. PyTorch benchmarking utilities are aimed at PyTorch users and developers. Of course, you can roll your own benchmarking utilities, but it requires taking care of a few problems. You want benchmarks to run long enough to get reliable time and measurements, but you don't want them to run forever. You need to collect statistics to estimate noise in the measurements. You need to make sure that you are comparing apples to apples, that all synchronizations are called, and multithreading on the CPU is properly controlled. If you are a developer working on a new operation for PyTorch, or if you are working on an existing operation, you want to make sure that the performance is good uh, for a variety of input sizes and not just for a particular uh, input size resulting in hyper-optimization. After all your benchmarking is done, you're likely left with a wall of numbers that is hard to analyze and represent. So you need some way of post-processing the data. Our benchmarking utilities make all of these things easy. This snippet shows how to use a timer and compare APIs to compare performance of two similar PyTorch operations, take and gather, on the different data types. Timer APIs are modeled on Python timers, so they should feel familiar. They also have some additional uh, options to include metadata to make subsequent analysis a little bit easier. And the left part of the slide shows the output of this uh, script uh, where the times are shown in tabular form. We hope that you find our benchmarking utilities convenient. Uh, here are uh, resources uh, that you can use to get more information about the topics I've talked about. Thank you for listening and hope to see you at PyTorch Performance Discussion. Mm -hmm.